Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. And today I have with me artist Matt Chamberlain, who happens to be a fellow Mainer. Really great to have you in the studio with me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Matt, you have only very recently started working with the Portland Art Gallery, but you've been an artist for a long time. I have, yeah. Basically my entire life. I, it's uh, taken twists and turns, but I've always made stuff, so... So tell me about some of the earliest stuff that you remember making. You grew up in South Portland. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was, you know, I always drew. I always, you know, it was like I did a lot of comics and stuff when I was a kid. Um, I mean, I also was obsessive. I, I colored the walls of my basement with black crayon because I wanted it to look like um, the Batcave because I was obsessed with Batman when I was younger. Um, and how did your parents feel about that? That, that was, uh, you know, they, they were a little taken back by it, but they, they've always been very supportive, so they let, me, they let me keep it. But it was one of those things I did in secrecy, and then they came downstairs, and it was just completely covered in black crayon. But All right. Well, I love to hear that they were so supportive. I mean, my brothers and sisters colored on the walls, and I don't think my parents felt quite as supportive of their art uh, careers yeah. in their early years. Yeah, I was pre I'm pretty lucky for sure. They've always they've always supported everything I've done, which is you can't say that about everyone for sure. Well, that's true. Yeah. So you started with the with the coloring on the walls, yeah. and the drawing of the comics and mm -hmm. Batman, and and did you continue to do this work when you were in high school? No, I mean I did. Um, I took art all four years. I took AP art and, uh, basically it was, you know, the, the typical, you know, you do your assignments and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, I was always just, it was just an obsessive thing for me. I couldn't stop. So, um, it was one of those things where I knew that that was my future, but I didn't know how to get there. And, uh, so I think, you know, after high school, I just decided I was just going to work in restaurants because it was an actual job. Um, but realized quickly it was like it's it's still a creative endeavor. And so everything I've ever done is either with my hands or, you know, my creative some sort of creative form. So when you say you, you realize this is what you wanted to do, but you didn't know how to get there. You mean you didn't know how to have somebody pay you for doing something yeah. that you really enjoyed doing? It just didn't seem, yeah, it didn't seem like a viable job. And, and it didn't, it, there was no... It, it, Back then, there's no social media. There wasn't even an internet when I graduated high school, which is crazy to think about. But um, so, yeah, it was sort of like, how does this even happen? Um, but I took four or five years off after high school, worked in restaurants, and then um, decided to go to Mecca, just give it a shot and see what happens. So and I did it. It was, it was, I was a painting major. Um, even after graduation, though, I was like, I don't see this as something I can do full time, you know, and actually have a life. So I continued to work in restaurants, but I did that for 22 years up until about five years ago. And I haven't looked back. So you also took a little detour to New York and Israel a few times. I did. Yeah. I was, um, I moved to New York after Mecca. It was like every, every artist does, you know, thinking that they're in a, and I wound up not working at all in art. I did some teaching down there. I was working at a place called Kidville, which is uh, like a country club for kids, basically. Um, I had Seinfeld's kid. I had, you know, Andre Agassi's kid. Um, and just taught, you know, young kids, little, you know, basic art fundamentals. But it was, and I taught cooking there too, which was interesting. Teaching three-year-olds how to marinate chicken is not something that I would recommend, <laughs> but I did it. So, Did they see the value in it as three-year-old? No, not at all. It was just something, it was just like a fun tactile thing for them to do, I think. There was no, I don't think there were any lessons learned there, but it was fun. So you had, so you had Kidville, mm -hmm. um, and then you, you were with somebody who was from Israel. Yes. Um, and we went a couple times, um, which was great. It was, uh, I went for about a month at a time each time and it was very eye-opening experience. I mean, the whole, that whole period of my life too, I, I was living in Harlem, which was very different from, you know, I grew up in Maine and spent the first 27 years of my life there and moving to Harlem is, was like a 
completely different world for sure. Um, and very valuable. I mean, honestly, like just being able to get out of my comfort zone and, and learn about other people, which is, it's great. Well, I think I can envision why Harlem might be different, but what, what was your experience as far as the differences? Um, just pace of life. Uh, you know, I was used to walking out my door here in the West End and, you know, it's, it's very quiet and sort of, you know, it's just, you walk down the street and you see people, you know, like, but I was on 125th street and Broadway and it was, there was a train above ground and, um, it was just a culture shock too. um, you know, being surrounded by cultures that I really never, um, got to experience here. So it was, it was wonderful. And what about the cooking piece? You you worked for a time at 4th Street. I did, yeah. That was my first real restaurant job. I think I was 20. Um, I had had a friend who was working there, and he, they were looking for a prep cook. And I was like, okay, let me give it a shot. And I did it for two years. Um, it was basically like culinary boot camp. Like I, I learned everything there. Um, and it really form my opinion about food and, and just how things are done. Um, it was hard it was very hard. It's, I mean, restaurant work is probably some of the hardest work out there that uh, you don't get paid for it either. So there's that, but, um, the amount of things I learned are invaluable, I think. And working with Sam Hayward and Esau Crosby and a couple other people, it was just like, this is, you can't trade that in for anything. So. Well, that's true. And and you were working at Forest Street and with Sam, it sounds like kind of early, earlier on. Yeah, it was before Portland was Portland, really. Um, it was it, that I think Forest Street was really at the cusp of, uh, you know, and started all of this food movement in Portland. Um, and, you know, nothing like it existed, I don't think, um, especially in Maine. And I think even around the country, it wasn't really a thing. Um you know, you're basically eating the season, you know, it's, uh, everything comes in every day, you know, different purveyors, different, it's, it just, it was a mind blowing experience to, to see this is what food actually is. And this is how it should be done. My daughter also is in food currently. And interestingly enough, she also, um, has an art background and, I, it's, it's interesting to think about the the creative aspects of cooking for for some of us who just oh there's a recipe I'm going to do my recipe I'm going to you know it's a kind of a utilitarian thing but for people at higher levels of um, there is this bringing ingredients together it's how you present it it's yeah. creating a whole experience for the person that's eating the food yeah I mean I think I treat the way I work um, in both fields pretty much the same. I have, I have my mise en place, even when I paint, you know, it's sort of like, just get everything ready and then go. And then, you know, it, you just, it kind of takes you where you want it to go. That's the way I cook too. I don't really follow recipes. I just sort of do everything intuitively. And I think same way with painting. It's a, it's the, it's intuitive, it's reactionary. It's a, it's all about the process. And then like, I think the only difference between food and art is the the end result. And it's like you can't eat what you're painting, but um, it's it's the same for me. Although it's interesting to have seen with social media that a lot of people are understanding food as being art and, and capturing it. For sure. Yeah, I don't think it was, uh, I think that's pretty new, um, you know, within the past 20 years or so. Um, I don't think it was always considered that. I think it was more of a utilitarian sort of like need or necessary thing where now I think it's people are actually appreciating and opening their eyes to, oh, this is, and I, I think it, you know, makes a bridge to other cultures. You can, I mean, I think understanding people through food is really a, a, an important and one of the easier ways to understand people. So when you've traveled to other places, have you spent time trying to understand people's palates and the food choices that they're making? For sure, yeah. I mean, it, it's um, I, I'm going to Europe uh, at the end of the month and I'm going to Madrid and Rome and Paris, and I think I'm just going to eat my way through and 
I'm just so excited. It's a perfect time too. It's the end of the harvest, the end of the summer. So it's like, I can't wait for what that's going to bring. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, when I was in Israel, I was like, my eyes were completely open to like just this totally different uh, way of cooking and like just the idea of how, what food is for you. And um, it, yeah, it really just informed a lot of how I went forward in, in things that I did in, in food. Tell me about that. Uh, just, you know, uh, basically, I mean, I st- after working at 4th Street, I, you know, I understood ingredients were really important. Um, but, you know, it wasn't, they're still not that accessible around here in terms of, you know, especially monetarily, it's, it's, it's expensive to buy good food. But um, over there, they treat food in a different way in terms of, it's, it's, it's all about love, really. It's about family and, and it's, um, and that to me is really important. So. As you were talking, I was thinking about, um, a trip that my family and I took to Madrid while my son was in college over there for a little bit. And I remember that there would be these enormous, um, I guess, legs of pigs because they Mm -hmm. were very much into eating pigs. Um, But that wasn't the most, I mean, that was striking because obviously if you have a pig leg just kind of sitting there while everybody's, you know, Mm -hmm. chatting and having tapas and whatever, uh, that felt a little just different than what we do. But um, more interesting was just the amount of time that people would spend around the table, that people would gather and they would be there forever and it would not be just the adults going out in the evenings, it would be the children and Mm -hmm. multi-generational. And it, we don't seem to have quite that same thing here. No, I don't think so. I mean, I I owned a catering company for 10 years and um, we did a lot of weddings. And, and one of the things I always wanted people to do is I sort of pushed them towards family style um, instead of doing a buffet or, or plated um, because I felt like it's communal. You're sitting around a table with a bunch of people you may not know and you've got all these platters in front of you and you have to sort of engage with everyone. So um, that was definitely informed by my experiences, you know, going over there and like just feeling like, oh, this is more of a ceremony. This is more of a, you know, it's it's a celebration. Um, and obviously weddings are, so I feel like it kind of aligned with that. What was it that caused you to make that very specific choice to move into art and away from food? Um, I think it just honestly burnt out. Uh, um, it was 22 years of doing it. Um, and I had owned a company for 10. We had a shop, um, for three years, um, in the original Miyake building on spring street. Um, and you know, we would do 20, 30 weddings a year. Um, so the weekends were gone my life was gone. It was sort of like, okay, I'm not in any debt. I think it's time to move on. I I found it to be more work after a while than, than pleasure. It wasn't, you know, I sort of got into food because I wanted it to be fun and it just wasn't, wasn't fun anymore, but I still love to cook for people. It's just now I just cook for people I love and that's, that's sort of how it works for me. So it was a, it was an interesting, it was a tough time for sure. Like it it was my baby and I, you know, sort of decided that I needed to, to move on. So. Well, also owning your own business. I mean, that is its own, um, set of, I guess, opportunities and challenges. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I went into it a little green and, you know, I was just sort of like, when I first started, it was just me, um, for the first six years or so. Um, and I was mostly a private chef. Um, and that was great because you're, you're, you're going into people's homes and like, it, again, it's more of a celebration. And like, um, once it started to become more of a day to day operation and sort of like, oh, I gotta, you know, I've got to remember what order this, I've got to do this, I've got to do that taxes, payroll, blah, blah, blah. It was just, it just got to be too much. So I decided that wasn't for me. <laughs> Did you also start to see more success with regard to your art? Did you finally come to a place where you thought, oh, maybe I can make a living out of this? Uh, It was a weird thing. So I I sort of 
backdoored my way into that. I I was as soon as I finished the the shop, I I started painting again, and it was sort of like a therapy thing for me. Um, but I was like, wow, these are actually pretty good. I I I remember how to do this because I didn't really get to paint when I was when I was owning a business. It just didn't have time. Um, so going back to that was like a revelation for me, and I was like, okay, um, I think I'm gonna try to do this. I had other jobs, you know, just day jobs, but, um, it really turned into something more. And I had randomly reached out to my friend, Tyler Carew, who's a designer. And I asked her if she ever needed things for staging, just for photo shoots. And, um, she said, yeah, of course. And every time I put one in a home for a photo shoot, it would get sold by, you know, to the homeowner. So it was like, okay, this actually could work. Um, and it kind of snowballed from there. And I was like, I'm just going to do it. And that's that's kind of how I'd live life anyway. I just like, I'm going to do it. It's just, there's no way. Now, if I put my mind towards something, it's like, you can't, you got to get out of the way. <laughs> so that's sort of how that happened. I know that on, on social media, um, one of our friends, Krista Stokes, she's also a big fan of yeah. yours. And she's an interior designer mm-hmm. with a very, you know, wonderful visual sense. And I think that working together with interior designers and and bringing kind of something beautiful into a really practical setting, I think that's a really nice relationship to have. It is. It's interesting because I didn't think about it. Um, You know, when you're in school, you think it's it's more about getting into galleries and doing shows. and, and, And that's in that sense of that's the that's the professional way to do it. And um, you know, you think of interior design, you know, I'm a child, a product of the nineties where you, you, you think about selling out and, uh, even though that's not a thing anymore for sure, but it, it, um, uh, it's one of those things where you're like, Oh yeah, well, why wouldn't I do this? Like I can put my work out there and I, I want to be in people's homes. I want to, you know, like, I think that, um, it's the same thing with visiting like a, as a private chef, you know? being there and, and contributing to their lives, I think is, is a great feeling for me. Tell me about this piece behind us for people who are listening to the podcast. Um, and hopefully they'll, they'll actually take the time to watch so that they can see what we're referring to. But this was actually a commission that you did for someone. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been a labor of love. It, it, she asked me to do it probably about a year ago. So it's been one of those things where I started it in the middle of the pandemic and um, I just couldn't figure out where I needed it to go. And um, eventually, I mean, this is like seven or eight layers of of stuff. Um, It eventually came together, but I had to like let it rest for a while. It was one of those things where you're just like, I got to think about something else and, and, and then come back to it. So, um, I think it's finally, yeah, I'm happy with it. And it, it's one of those things where, okay, it's like, okay, I, I'm going to let this one go. Um, and she was happy with it. So that's always good. So what types of things did you use in creating this? So this is, um, there's multiple layers here, but, um, Generally underneath, it's always acrylics and, um, you know, a lot of pencils and um, charcoals and stuff. Um, And then over the top of it, I used uh, spray paint for a lot of it um, to get these blocks. And then I covered it in a two-part epoxy resin um, to get this, like, sort of glass feeling to it um, as, like, another layer just... I'm all about layers. It's sort of like I just need depth and history to things. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, and then on the top, it's just like little little gestures and marks that, you know, um, that the resin allows you to do different things with paint that you can't do when when it's directly on canvas or, or panel. Um, you can kind of smear it around and, like, it, it makes interesting marks. Um, so that's why I went with that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it took a while and I'm glad it's done, <laughs> to be honest with you. I'd still be happy to hang it. it. It almost has a little bit of an urban feel to it. It does, I suppose. Yeah. I never really thought about it that way. Um, I never, it's kind of a, a, a different piece for me. I, it's a lot more geometric than usual. Um, 
a lot of my stuff is a lot more organic feeling. Um, and I don't know why, you know, I sort of let myself do what I'm doing. I, I sort of black out when I'm painting. I just kind of, it's lose myself. Um, and in the process and just let it happen. And somehow this is what, what came out. Um, it definitely wasn't meant to be urban feeling, but, um, I'm sure life experiences informed that in some back channel in my mind. Well, you were saying that this is this was very much a part of your pandemic experience. Not that yeah. that has anything to do with being urban necessarily. Right. Yeah, I you know the pandemic was interesting. I was alone for the first five months, um, and then the building I was living in sold, so I wound up having to move. So I wound up going out to Western Mass to my friends place and they have this really old barn um and i've painted there in the past and I, they were kind enough to just let me stay for basically the whole summer into the fall and i just painted and hung out and worked in the garden and that was uh, that was actually very therapeutic for sure because being alone wasn't wasn't fun either it was first couple of weeks was fine i'm like oh i don't have to talk to anybody this is nice um and i worked a lot and then i sort of just kind of you know like everyone it just you, you just start feeling lonely so you just it was really nice to be able to go out and be with people who are some of your artistic influences um i love rauschenberg robert rauschenberg um basquiat helen frankenthaler um Jackson Pollock, uh, like the, I, the, I, the romantic idea of him, he's not necessarily, visually it's not necessarily what I like, but it's just the idea of this sort of, I don't know, just, he just kind of did what he wanted to do. And I think that is, is admirable. It's just, it's like, don't, you know, there's no pigeonhole in there. You just sort of, so I try to, you know, I basically just, I love to work, um, in ways that I don't understand where it's going to go. And, and that sort of flux of it's, it's a little intimidating. It's a little scary, but it, it, it eventually I trust myself and I trust the process and usually it comes out. Okay. Well, it's interesting because I'm thinking about what you said about cooking where you, there's simultaneously a need for preparation, but also a need for flexibility of mind. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, and I would say painting probably has some um, parallels. Yes, for sure. And I think cooking has totally informed that and helped me along the way in terms of not getting frustrated and trusting that, it, okay, you can fix this. Or, you know, the nice thing about paint, too, is you can paint over it. Um, food, if you put too much salt, then you, you, you're, you might be, you're in trouble. But um, it you can still make adjustments in food and that I think um, has informed a lot of the way I work. Has it been a challenge for you to move from a place of being employed by someone else to being self-employed to now being self-employed again, but having a little bit more looseness as to what the final product is? It is, it is and it isn't. I mean, it's, a, it's, I'm in a really lucky position. Um, I think, not many people get to do what they love. Um, but it's also scary. And I also have to like set goals and boundaries for myself. Um, that has, that's been a challenge for sure, because, you know, you may not feel like doing something someday, but you have to kind of, because it's the only way out you have to, you, <laughs> there's, you have to do it. So, um, yeah, it's been interesting to like sort of, figure out a new way of uh, motivation and a new way of working. Um, you know, I've been this past week, I've been up till four in the morning, a lot of nights and that's, um, it's been interesting for, you know, my days of <laughs> sort of being in a fog, but, um, when I get going, I can't stop. So it's sort of, um, I just let it happen. So for you, it's, it's, just a really a question of kind of putting yourself in the right place, saying this is this is where I am, this is where I'm going to start, this yeah. is kind of where I want to end up in in a bigger sense. Yeah. But then once you're once you're doing it, you're just engaged. Yeah, I mean, um, 
that's just the thing. I, it's, it's literally just about starting. Um, it, it, you can sit around and, and think about things all day, but if you don't just start, you're never, it's never going to happen. So, um, you know, being in charge of that and sort of making a discipline for yourself, it's, it's important. It's very, it's, it's unique and it's different than food, um, in that aspect where it's like, a, you know, I, food, you have deadlines more than you, than you necessarily do in, in making art. Um, people tend to give you a little more leeway when you say like, I'll get it to you when I, you know, when it's done, but food, you know, the, you, you have to get it done when it's, when it's, you know, when the time has come. So. How do you, um, how do you reconcile the idea of being an artist and doing what feels right to you versus what someone else might want from you? Um, I generally, I mean, most people give me the leeway to do what I want, which is nice. Um, you know, they'll have, if it's a commission for a specific space, then, you know, I'll go to, I'll go visit the space and like sort of get a sense of what would feel right. Um, you know, and some people will say like Tyler will ask, you know, I need something with some blues or some blood, you know, but other than that, I, I sort of, it's, I get free reign, which is really nice, but it's also scary too because i'm like i don't know if they're gonna like this generally hopefully people do but <laughs> it's um it's a gamble i suppose but and as you're moving toward this representation with the portland art gallery now you just get to kind of create what you're going to create yeah it's exciting and frightening at the same time uh i think i'm putting a lot of pressure on myself which is good i think if i didn't um I shouldn't be doing this, you know, it's sort of one of those things. And I was, I was listening to your podcast with Dietland and talking about, um, imposter syndrome and that sort of thing. And it's like, that certainly is creeps in, you know, here and there, but, um, I am generally pretty confident, but you know, if I was always confident, I don't think I should be doing it, you know, why an art gallery and why now? I, it's, it's interesting because like it, it wasn't something that I really thought about. I was like, I was doing fine without representation, but, um, that whole side part of media and putting, you know, just, there's a lot of work other than just painting, um, to get your stuff out there. And I felt it was the right time to like, just concentrate on the work and have someone else do the other stuff for me, which is, you know, when I worked, when I had the catering company, I had a business partner who did all of the, like a lot of the payroll and paperwork and stuff like that. Because like we were talking about earlier, math is not my strong suit. Um, so to have someone with more knowledge than me as well, um, able to represent me and then put me out in the world, I, I was like that, I can't really go wrong with that. Yes, I think you're you're referring to our conversation before we got on the air about numbers and um, adding up and and I think that for, I also feel this way. You know, there's there are some things I know that I do very well, other things that I know that I don't do very well, and yeah. so it's always good to have people to partner with you that can kind of help you with those things that that they know better than you do. Yes, for sure. Um, no one can do everything, and that's I've learned that many times <laughs> over. Um, cause I'm definitely someone that wants to be able to do everything and, and, you know, will helicopter parent if, you know, especially employees or whatever, I would, I would, you know, be definitely be a little, there were times where I just had to let go and that's one of the hardest things in the world to do. That's interesting because it seems like you have pretty high expectations for yourself and high expectations for what you produce and that. Um, might kind of bump up against this idea of having, being a little bit more freewheeling, flexible mind. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to, going on there. There is. Um, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> like, you know, um, I think it's going to be great. I it just, um, it's one of those things that I think will take some adjustment time and um, maybe some stumbling, but I think in the long run, I think it's going to be great. Did you ever come back to the to the teaching? Did you ever come back to 
sharing your knowledge? That job was honestly like a, it was just out of necessity and it just happened to be, I I knew someone that was already working there and it was like, okay, I'll do this. And it was, you know, it was into fields that I loved, um, sort of, you know, but um, it was more of a necessity. And I, the idea of teaching is interesting, but I don't know. I don't know if I could, to be honest with you. I don't know if I could teach adults. It's sort of like just something. I think I judge myself too harshly, and it would be difficult to difficult to do. Well, I'm I'm when I've talked to various artists, it is interesting because some artists do love to teach. It's a pretty significant part of the work that they do. Others don't do any teaching at all. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you dabbled in it and, you know, just it wasn't a strong pull for you, at least not at that time or right now. Yeah. It could be down the road. Um, but yeah, it's not something I'm, I'm looking at right now. It's just something I, I think I need to concentrate on myself at this point and just get to where I need to be. Well, I am... Which is selfish, but just, we're artists sometimes, and we are that way. Well, it sounds like you've spent a lot of time doing things with and for other people. So maybe it's not so much selfish as just kind of completing a piece of your existence that yeah. you haven't had the time to do that with before. Yeah. Well, I'm very pleased to have had the opportunity to talk with you, and also very pleased that you're coming in as an art gallery artist, knowing that it's a wonderful community and there's... Um, Having my having the opportunity to talk with people in this forum, but also at art gallery openings is really a pleasure. But one on one, getting to know people is a lot of fun. This was very nice. Thank you so much for having me. I've been speaking with Portland art gallery artist Matt Chamberlain, a Maine native. I encourage you to learn more about Matt on the Portland Art Gallery website and also through social media. And uh, coming up in the art gallery with some of his pieces being on display. Thank you so much for being on Radio Maine today, Matt. Thank you so much. Take care.